Let's see. All right, so the recording should have started. Let me go ahead and share my desktop. And I'm just going to ask folks to let me know. All right, the desktop, everything look good? All right, I'm assuming that everybody can see it okay. Yes, no. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's let's just jump in here and let's take a look. Um, let me update this. On Piazza, uh, I was looking a little bit ahead of time to see what was really common. And it looks like yeah, memory regions is still tied with number one now. The second most... Oh, being hazards related to forwarding installs. Okay, so let's let's start at memory regions and we'll jump around. Feel free to do the poll if you want your your you know your opinion to weigh in on what we go over, what we prioritize here. And I try to keep the uh, the time limit like right at at the one hour mark so the video doesn't get too long and, and cumbersome. Um, so let's talk about memory regions and I'm, how I'd like you to think about them is really just think about them in terms of three um, areas. Okay, so. If this is all, if this is the entire uh, memory space, okay, and here at a high address, and here being a low address, okay, we really have three regions. We have one region that grows downwards, and that region is our stack memory, okay. We have a region down here all the way at the bottom that is our fixed memory okay sometimes referred to as static all right now in class we actually looked at different at how we could actually break that up in different regions to kind of go further um and the regions tend to have um a little bit more they're broken up basically on what level of permissions um you had for those areas right some basically were um you were only able to read Okay, for example, of that would actually be like, say, where the code is, right? You don't want a program while it's running to actually edit the code, right? That would be a sign of basically a virus. There's actually a lot of security issues that come up when you talk about memory. Um, but we're going to just talk about fixed or static memory as being like one region, right? And then we have growing upwards, okay, is our heap memory. Okay, so the fixed region, like just like its name is, it actually is fixed in size. It doesn't grow. Okay, the this region here, fixed memory, is the same size for the entire duration run of the program, and that has things like the computer code. It has things like constant variables, global variables, right? Things that are just basically allocated once. It's known at compile time how big that needs to be. Right, and it doesn't grow or adjust during the execution of the program. Okay, um, so fixed, yeah, things like, like I said, global variables, constants, computer code. Right, those are examples of things that would that would belong in there, as well as anything that was prefixed with the word static, which we looked at in class as an example. Okay, now let's let's go a little bit deeper in terms of stack versus heap. Okay, stack is if we look at say a function function foo okay any variables that are contained within that function right including parameters by the way including any parameters that were um, here right we've seen that this this function right anything that is contained around the definition of it that has it's called function scope, okay, that's supposed to be a C, right, anything that has function scope is, um, is also kind of referred to as, oops, I'm going to zoom back out here, finger slipped, um, is also referred to as local, right, like local variables. And what happens with those is when that function's called, Right, we have when that function, let's say foo, is called, wherever the existing stack pointer is, right, we actually saw this both, we saw this in assembly as well as kind of using it in when we're writing C code, right, but kind of underneath the hood a little bit when we're using C, some of the details are hidden. Now, when, when the function's called, right, the stack pointer is going to move to a lower address. 
okay, and any local variables for this function, right, any local variables that are, say, defined in here, we're basically making room so that any of those local variables that we can store them in that stack memory, okay. The key thing for the stack, right, is it's, for one, the name, the fact that it's also often referred to as automatic memory, which I think is a more descriptive name, but is not as commonly used. Um, the stack memory will grow when the function's called, right? So when function foo is called, right, we're, at, we're growing the memory region. We're allowing more space for that data, okay? When that function returns, when foo returns, the stack pointer is going to revert back to its previous location, right, effectively freeing this data, this space in memory to be used again, right, for like the next function call, right, for some other purpose. So the stack will grow and make space for local variables when a function is called, right? And when a function returns, it will shrink, making room to be used again by something else for another function or whatever purpose, okay? Um, so that's how the stack works, right? It's, it's really meant for storing local variables for functions, okay? And if you have, like, nested functions... Right, where you have one function calling another, that's really where you see the, the stack truly grow, right? When one function is calling another, because it's growing, because you're calling something, you're pushing onto the stack each time at the function call, and until those functions start returning, you're not actually freeing anything, okay? So, we, as we've seen, like, just like we've seen in class, right, is that the stack is useful most of the time, right? Most of the time, you're, you tend to want... Um, you don't really want to deal with a lot of the headaches of allocating and deallocating memory. You just really want to just call functions and have memory allocated for you. And when the function returns, you don't need those local variables anymore that the scope is contained within that function. You want to go ahead and let that, that data get freed. Okay, so most of the time that, that works for you. Okay? Um, however, we've also seen situations in which that breaks down, right? In which you need something, um, you need to store something in the heap. Right, which is our manual memory, also sometimes referred to as the free store. Okay? Most common name is the heap, though, and, and it's important to know the, the common names that people tend to use. Okay? But I look at that as manual is really the most descriptive name for that region. The difference between the stack and the heap is you are now responsible as the programmer for allocating that space. Okay? You decide when something is going to be stored there, and you decide when that memory is going to be deallocated. Okay, so heap is going to be, is that space is going to be allocated when we use something like malloc, okay, where we're saying, hey, I need this many bytes on the heap, okay, it, we can change the size of that using realloc, which says, hey, I previously allocated X number of bytes, I now want to allocate more or less, okay, and we're using free to indicate that we hey, we're done with that memory, go ahead and, and get rid of it, okay? So that region is um, why it's often referred to as dynamic memory is because you are, it's dynamic during the, basically, at runtime, right? It changes based on the programming logic, right? So you're allowed to have programming logic. You can build if statements, right, conditional statements that determine how and when the memory should grow or shrink Right, when something should be stored in memory, when it should be removed, um, based on the logic of the program at runtime. Okay, where the stack, the growing and shrinking happens by when the functions are called or return. Right, so it's you you have a far greater level of control when you're using dynamic memory, and it's useful for certain purposes. Okay, um, examples of that, like I think a kind of a, a really clear example would be say reading in something from a file. Okay, so dynamic memory, like you're reading in data from a file, right? You have data coming in. You don't know how if you don't know how big that file is, right? You want that size of how much memory you're using to be based on. Hey, I need the file. I'm keep reading stuff in from the file. I need more and more bytes, and that programming logic to drive that decision making process of, when, you know, of how much should be allocated. Okay, there's no way of just having a function, just kind of do that based on just calling a fun you know calling a function and allocating a proper amount of space. You're either gonna way overestimate it or underestimate it. You have to have you dealing with fixed sized amounts. Um, 
Okay, so we can go deeper into that. Let me pause. Let me see if we have any questions. Um, okay, it doesn't look like we have any yet. Okay, feel free to ask at any point. We could also go deeper into things like basically questions looking at, say, dynamic memory, basically using things related, you know, how storing stuff on the heap, looking at some examples. We can absolutely do that, right? I'm kind of first focusing on looking at that Piazza um, feedback in terms of folks looking like, let me refresh this, see if we kind of update it a bit. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're talking about here, just talking about the general regions, right, the memory regions. Um, dynamic memory allocation is using the heap, right? So when I look at that uh, feedback there, that tells me that when folks are saying, hey, I really want to focus on just how we allocate stuff for the heap. Um, and we can certainly do that, but I want to make sure to prioritize what people have been saying here. Um, so this was just an overview of the three main areas of memory that we've really focused in on in, in class. Okay, so um, let me maybe bounce around a little bit based on some of the feedback here. And I can certainly go deeper, answer questions and things like that based on uh, feedback, okay, and questions that folks have. Um, but maybe we can bounce around and go to the next most popular one that folks wanted to see, which was related to hazards, forwarding, and stalls, okay? So, uh, so now we're going, you know, we're going back earlier in the semester, um, and we're looking at, um, actually, let me maybe even pull up some examples here. Well, you know what, let me first start with, um, let's look at forwarding, okay? And before even pulling up any um, any diagrams or anything like that, um, let, let's just talk a little bit about forwarding. Okay, so forwarding, we know, only comes up in the context of the MIPS pipeline architecture. The reason for that is that in the pipeline architecture, we have five instructions that are running in parallel, right? We have five instructions that are running in parallel. And because of that, there's a, basically there's what's often referred to as a race condition um, can occur. And actually I might, might make sense for me to actually pull up the reference sheet here as an example of, of showing some of this stuff. So, um, for example, if we look at the diagram here, let's see, hopefully this is going to draw um, in kind of in a way that's easy to see. If we look at this example here, right, we see our five stages. Yeah, i got to make that thicker. Uh, let me see. Um, You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to use this in my little, I'm just going to cheat a little bit and use this for, it's easier to draw in Word. I'm going to copy this over. Just to just make it a little easier for everyone to see. All right, so if we look at the pipeline here, we have our five stages. Okay. An issue can happen is that, say we're running the following program. Okay. I'm just using registers one, two, and three just to make the numbers a little easier to see. Yeah, I'm just going to stick with those. Okay, so this is the first line says add one, two, and three, right? Those are registers one, two, and three. The second one is add three, four, and one. Registers four, three, and one. Now, let's call this instruction one, and let's call this instruction two. Okay, the problem can occur is that if we look here, let's look at the situation where instruction one is in um, stage five, the right back stage, okay? 
and instruction two, right, um, is in its uh, uh, memrems, uh, the memory stage, right, the memory access stage. Okay. Now, the idea is, if we did nothing, right, if we if we did not have any forwarding, if we did nothing, there's a big problem that happens, right, and that's the fact that instruction one doesn't actually write back, like if we follow this, if I, this line down here, if we follow this, instruction one doesn't actually, doesn't actually write to the register until the fifth stage, clock cycle five, okay? The problem though is instruction two, previously one clock cycle prior has already used the old data. Right, or think of it another way, two clock cycles prior, right? One clock cycle two had already read memory. Okay, so instruction two has already read memory two clock cycles prior, and it read in particular, if we look at this, the biggest issue is that register one right, is being written to by instruction one, and it's being read by instruction two, but there's a timing issue, right? So this is stuff you should really already know, uh, you know, quite well, because it's kind of the basics of kind of setting this up, right, is the fact that what we've got here is a situation in which instruction two has, if we didn't forward or we didn't do anything, has read the wrong data, right? It's read the data that was, um, that was previously in register one, um, and so the results, the computation, if we didn't forward, would be inaccurate, okay? So let's break this down in a, a couple things, right? Let's, let's just first recognize the fact that the forwarding unit, okay, takes place in the third stage, the execute stage, okay? The reason for that is even though the registers are read in the second stage, we don't actually perform any computation with them until the third stage, right, when they go into the ALU, okay? The idea is we're trying to prolong when we need to take action as long as possible. It gives actually more time to be able to deal with issues um, by prolonging it, right? It actually reduces the, the complexity of the, um, um, of the processor by, by delaying that. But anyway, so we don't have to worry about it until the third stage, okay? So we really have an issue in which we really only need to forward when there's um, where the instruction that's dependent on this say instruction one here is either in the mem stage or the execute stage well basically within two clock cycles after that instruction was read all right so let me give you some concrete examples right of that to kind of change the color back here oh well whatever stick with purple all right, so if we had this, structure, register one, two, and three, all right, and I'll just make up some registers here. Okay, so this is just kind of just making up an example. Um, so here we've got the, here's the dependency that, that we've kind of, um, where we need to forward, okay? Is register one is written to, okay? And it's being read here, okay? And if we don't forward, that's gonna cause a problem, right? Because we need, with anything that's within two clock cycles after the, the write is gonna cause an issue when we look at this diagram up here and we kind of trace it out. Okay, anything within that two clock cycle window, okay, from when instruction one would have written to the register. Okay, the reason it's not three, by the way, is if you recall that we can actually read and write to the same register on the same clock cycle. Okay, if you recall that the, the actually the read and the write happens so fast 
that we can actually write to the clock cycle in the first half of the clock cycle and read in the second half. Okay, um, so that's actually why we only have to worry about this stage. Okay, in this stage. Okay, the ones that are within two clock cycles of uh, that dependency. Okay, so forwarding is going to have to happen here. It's also going to have to happen here. Okay, this one forwarding is not needed. Okay, the reason is that um, is kind of what I said before is that we can we can write and read to a register on the same clock cycle. Okay, so that's the rationale. So it's actually not needed for this one. Okay. Um, okay. In terms of tracing it, I'm going to kind of do this somewhat quick in the, in the interest of time. Um, is that what you want to remember? Right? Is you want to remember that the forwarding is always going to happen in the instruction that's dependent. Right? Like say in this case say instruction two or instruction three, right? It's only going to happen for those instructions when they're in the third stage. Okay, it's only going to happen when they're in the third stage. Okay, the execute stage. All right. So, it, forwarding is going to take place at clock cycle four for instruction two. And if this works, clock cycle five. I don't know. For instruction three. Okay. Let's just look at clock cycle four for instruction two. Okay. What we want to remember in that case is instruction one is only one clock cycle further ahead. Okay. Is only one clock cycle further ahead than clock cycle three. All right. So instruction one in this in that case would be here in the mem stage. Okay, while well, instruction two is here. Okay, and our instruction one that we need to forward to, okay, our instruction one here is the first register that's read. Okay, four being the second. Right, so that's going to be related to forwarding A. So this is the control signal here that we really care about. Okay, we know B is going to be zero because there's no forwarding. Right, that will select this wire for B, which is the same normal one that had previously come out of that register. Okay, so which is just the normal case that we've seen without forwarding. Right, so nothing unique or special there. Okay, A we know is not going to be zero. To figure out what it is, we know it's going to be because instruction one is in the mem stage. We're going to take that wire down and around, trace it over, being very careful not to make a mistake, which is easy to do. Okay. And we see that that wire goes here, which is actually this, the, if we're starting from zero is the second um, input wire, right? Or the third, if we started at one. So that means this signal here, A, is going to be one zero, right? For two in binary. Okay. Which would then select that data to be what is the input um, operand uh, to the ALU. Okay, that's just so forwarding. It really, it depends on a couple things. I, I don't. I'm going to kind of do it somewhat fast um, in the interest of time, but it, it's understanding what it is, right? Why it's important. It's understanding, identifying when it occurs, right? Basically, being able to look at the instructions, say, oh, we need to forward this and that. Okay. Understanding the timing of when that happens, identifying the clock cycle. Okay. Um, and then once you know the clock cycle, you can basically say, oh, okay, at that clock cycle. Right, so this one here being at clock cycle four, doing a little bit of tracing and saying, oh, okay, we know it's got to be this signal here. Oops. Right. Um, you know that you can ignore that. Um, it's kind of just a, oh, actually, I might be able to delete it. Okay. Um, we know it's going to be that signal there. And um, so you just basically trace it. Oh, I know it's got to be that one. And then we know that that, is, that means that. Uh, the control signal forward A must be one zero. Okay, so that's forwarding. Okay, let me stop for a second. 
Um, okay, so so far, if you have questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll just keep moving forward here. Um, the other part was stalls. Okay, stalls actually happen here in this hazard detection unit, which is in the second stage. Okay, stalls a little bit different. Okay, stalls. The key thing with stalls, okay, is they only happen in certain cases revol involving the load word instruction. Okay, if you remember the load word instruction, there's kind of a special thing related to that. Let me kind of just copy this diagram over so we can really see it. Here we go. Load word instructions is the name comes for the fact that we've we've read data memory here. Okay, we've read this data memory and we're loading that result. Okay, we're loading that result all the way back to we're writing to a register. Okay. So load word is reads memory and writes to a register. Okay. The key thing to notice is unlike forwarding in which the result was calculated here, okay, the result, the dependency that we originally knew the proper value at the output of the ALU, you want to notice that the load word, it's actually one clock cycle later. Okay, it's happening in the mem stage instead of in the execute stage. Because of that, right, we have a problem in which we have the following scenario. We have a load word, and I'm just going to make up an instruction here. Okay, where we're reading an address in memory, and we're writing that value, in this case, register one. Okay. And if we happen to read that register, okay, if we happen to read that register within one clock cycle, okay, here's the dependency, okay, if we happen to read that register within one clock cycle, there's a big problem that occurs, okay, and that's this case instruction two. Right, instruction two is going to be in a situation in which it's here when instruction one is in the right back stage. Okay, which means instruction two, right, is has that same issue in which it's using um, invalid data that it read from register one. Okay, and forwarding will not work, right, because uh, forwarding basically when in, when this instruction instruction two when it was in the third stage um, the data that it needed that it was dependent on was not ready to be sent to that instruction okay because that data is not ready until it comes out of data memory for instruction one right notice that that one clock cycle difference makes a big is a big problem right so this is a situation where, you know, when you're, when processors are designed, right, when you're designing CPUs, the last thing you want to do is to delay anything, okay? You're just trying to make these things lightning fast and as efficient as possible, okay? This is a rare circumstance in which um, if you're running into this situation, there's really two options, right? We did look at one option in which the compiler can be smart enough to try to optimize things and avoid stalls, okay? If it can't do that, right, these instructions, what we have to do is basically stall the pipeline. Okay, which effectively means wait one clock cycle between the load word and the add. Okay, cause it to delay. And that will basically, what that does is it pushes instruction two to be here when instruction one is in this stage. Okay, then forwarding can work like normal. Okay, and this is often referred to as a no op, right? No operation, you know. It's just basically do, does nothing except waste time for one for that one clock cycle, right? Um. Okay, so the key thing, just like forwarding, the key thing is first identify why you need it, why it's important, when it occurs, okay, and then also determining that in this case, detecting when it happens, 
right? You can actually look at the diagram and figure that out. Like if you happen to forget, right? You don't have to memorize it. You can think about it, right? Like, okay, when must that happen, right? And when you look at that, you, you know, the diagram to kind of trigger your memory and help you remember this stuff is the hazard detection unit, right? Notice that it's sitting in the second stage, okay? And you can kind of just think rationally or logically about, well, what, what does that need to know to, to detect the situation that we drew on this side here? Okay, what does that need to know? Okay, well, it needs to know two things, right? It needs to know that, um, it needs to know whatever instruction is in this execute stage is a load word, okay? It's actually doing that, right, by looking at whether or not it's reading memory. Okay, it tells it right here, right? Load words read memory. So it looks at that control wire and says, hey, is that a one, right? So that's, that's how it determines if so the, what's in the execute stage is a load word, okay? And then the other thing it does, right, is it's, it looks and says, hey, is the, is the, um, um, is the um, register, right, if the register here that's being read, okay, is the register that's being read, right, notice we have, it's kind of a little bit hard to see, um, but notice that it says the load word, right, this data here, okay, is indicating this piece of information, right, that it's writing to that register, okay, and then we're also sending in some information for related to this register and this register, and it's basically checking. It's like, is, it a, is the instruction in the execute stage a load word? Okay, what register, if it is a load word, what register is it writing to? Okay, and is an instruction in the ID stage reading that same register? Okay, if so, right, you have a hazard, right, um, and you need, to, you need to stall. Okay, and then this will actually trigger the proper control signals to do that. Okay, so that you can kind of think it through. If you know the logic of what the process are doing, how stalls work, why we need them, you can actually, you can kind of logically think through it on the fly if you needed to, okay? Um, and just by looking through what information that that hazard detection unit must need to know, okay, in order to work properly. Okay, and that's the best way to think about these things is, you know, mem sometimes I see students trying to just memorize things without having that, the conceptual understanding, and that really does have diminishing returns. Um, in terms of how effective that is. Okay. Um, all right. All right. A couple people want to join. I think you should. Yeah. If you had if you had trouble joining, it's because you weren't logging in with your UAlbany credentials. But I it should be in now. But it, it's um, the UAlbany credentials are a um, it will automatically dump you into the into the the session. So that. But. Um, Otherwise, it prompts me for, for an approval thing. So, okay. Um, let's see. In the interest of time, let's kind of move forward here. And let me know if you have any questions. I'm just going to kind of refresh this. We talked about some of the hazard issues. We talked about dynamic memory. I mean, we talked about memory regions. Let's see. What else is really high? So we have a few that are kind of... Um, we've got a bunch that are tied, which makes it actually a little bit difficult to pick. Um, let me start with, I'm going to pick one that's kind of, I think, fairly fast to talk about, kind of get it out of the way, um, and then we can kind of go from there. Um, let's talk about performance issues between the single cycle and pipeline architectures. I think that explanation is, is pretty quick, so I think that makes sense, you know, since a lot of people ask that, and we can kind of use a limited amount of time to talk about that, it probably makes sense to, to do that. Okay, but here's the thing with the single cycle. Oops. Oh, hold on. I get. Um, I think my program crashed out on me that I was using to to draw. Give me one moment as it. I try to boot the thing back up. Okay, I think it worked. Okay, perfect. Make sure everybody's still in the session here. Okay, good. Um. All right, so the single, when we look at the, uh, the single cycle architecture, okay, the, the key thing is it just runs, as we know, it runs one instruction at a time, right? So what happens is there's just one long clock cycle 
and every instruction okay every instruction must run within that period of time right if this is if this is the time t every instruction must start in the, the instructions must finish within that long duration okay typically the load word is considered is the longest instruction to run okay so if other instructions let me kind of pick a different color here if other instructions let's say a r type could finish right if an r type just needed that much time okay and let's imagine maybe uh just picking kind of numbers here. It's imagine like the store word needed that much time, okay? But if the load word, right, needed that much time, the, the clock speed for a single cycle needs to be as long as the longest instruction. Okay? And it kind of ma it makes sense, right? Because other, you know, your the the clock speed is not variable, right? It's going to be running at a fixed duration, you know these regular ticks of the clock and um, you know you need if it's going to be that one clock cycle must have to fit in everything right every 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 instruction must be able to finish within that time period or you would have basically you know something like inconsistent states and problems with things being written in registers and so forth okay so the single cycle has drawbacks it's actually really not used in reality because you can get better performance right by doing things in parallel right a lot of computation happens in parallel like just in general you see it in especially in gpus graphic cards right those are there's a massive amount of things happening in parallel to make that happen efficiently so pipeline is that um the mips pipeline is an example of um, breaking out instructions into stages, right? We have those five stages. And I'm not going to get into too much detail because you really know a lot of that stuff already. But just talking about, like, what, what do we mean by some of the performance issues, right? Well, in general, right, if we didn't have to deal with uh, stalls or anything like that, okay, in, in a perfect world, you would be able to take this single cycle right and break it up evenly into exactly five even pieces okay such that the clock speed would be one-fifth okay of the single cycle time that's in the perfect world now in reality you don't get quite that speed up but um, in a perfect world you'd be able to break this out into five completely even chunks Right, that are exactly one fifth of the time to, be, to complete each piece, um, and that would give a five times speed up because we could literally run five instructions um, at a time. Okay, and that's that's kind of the the big thing. I don't want to get too deep in a lot of the details there. We looked at some issues related to latency and, and throughput. The idea being um, latency is the time that it takes from when an instruction starts to when it ends. Okay. And we looked at how it's actually a little bit counterintuitive, but in reality, because you tend not to get this exactly one-fifth um, even chunk, typically these times are typically that uh, if you strung the five clock ticks of a uh, pipeline to one of the single cycle, it would actually, the pipeline would be, those five ticks would be a little bit longer. Um, so if latency being from the time that an instruction starts, Okay, so the time that it completes, okay, okay the time that it's done, um, pipelines actually tends to be a little, have a little bit higher latency, it takes a little bit longer, right? But we usually don't care about that. Like if you're designing processors, you really don't care about that. What you're trying to do is get the most work done in a given period of time. And so what pipelines do is they maximize throughput, the amount of work that can be done in a given period of time. And we looked at one of those measures, which is actually where the word MIPS comes from, right? IPS, instructions per second. Okay, MIPS meaning millions of instructions per second. Okay, it's basically being pipelines optimize that. How many instructions per second, right, can you execute? Okay, and said, so, you know, the name MIPS is a little bit outdated now, 
because you're really not talking about millions. You're talking about billions of instructions per second. So it's, um, you know, the name used to be impressive. That's why they named it that. It's, um, but now it's actually, you know, that would be extraordinarily slow. Um, all right, so that's some of the main points, just to kind of talk about some of the key differences. Let me, uh, I don't want to get bogged down in that in the interest of time. Um, hmm, let's see, what did we have here? So we talked about that. So maybe we can jump back and we've talked about MIPS for a while. Maybe we jump back into C programming a bit. Um, and we have some questions related to pointers and files. So let's let's go into those and we just maybe pick one and we'll um, let me talk about pointer first and then and then we'll go into files. Files like we said we, we covered in class. I think it's a fairly simple um, topic that, that's really similar to other languages. There's not really a lot there that's new, but we'll we'll point out a couple things in, in this review session just to to um, kind of clarify that a little bit. Um, Okay, let's talk about pointers, and I'm going to try to focus on things that I know are the most common areas of confusion. Okay, um, Okay. so pointers. Um, this is where, like, just like I was saying in class and everything, I really, really highly recommend um, for a lot of these, uh, well, for certain types of questions, or you're trying to problem solve, and you're not sure about the proper syntax for using pointers, is I, I recommend drawing a little picture, right? Get a little scrap, you know, use a scrap piece of paper, something, draw it out. It, you're going to be much less likely to make a mistake, and you're also going to clarify things. And some of these questions are extremely hard to answer without drawing a little picture, just to keep some of the numbers straight and what's going where, okay? Um, and it says not some of the questions are designed to kind of like make sure you're understanding how some, you know, we've looked at ones for say exam number three and everything, and some of the things we're doing in class. They're designed along the sense of making sure they understand what pointers are actually doing, what the syntax means, and everything. And then, but even like pro, you know, when you're solving problems and trying to, you know, if you're writing a block of code it's using pointers, it, I, you see it, it's very common for for us to see students make mistakes of basically when to use like asterisks, when to use the ampersand, when or not to use them. Also, when we're talking about structures, using the arrow. Okay, there's different things, and they, it means different stuff, and we can kind of clarify it briefly. Now, um, let's start with the asterisks. Okay, number one thing to remember, right, just like we were seeing in class, is that um, there is a difference, okay, and you can put a space between these or not. It doesn't make a difference. I think Zybooks, I think, is often not using the space, but typically when you, most of the time that from programs I've seen people put the space there but regardless is if you're declaring a variable okay during the declaration okay the asterisk means something different when you're actually declaring a, a variable okay what that's saying is it's just saying hey this variable pointer is of type integer pointer meaning it's going to store an address of an integer all right, I'll draw that in a second. Okay. Now, as we've seen right a number of times, if we have another variable x that's an integer, that's storing the value that's that's a five, right? Now, let me write that a little more clearly. Okay, that's a five. Now, if I do something like this. Okay. If I do something like that, right, this here, right, that ampersand is referring to the address of X. Okay. The address of X. Okay. So that effectively makes this pointer point to this. Okay. That pointer point to that. And that's because if this was address, say, um, 1040, right, if that's the address here, that's the value that's going to get stored there is that address. Okay. So getting some of the syntax down is really important 
during declaring a variable, the asterisk means it's a type integer pointer. It's storing an address of an integer. Okay. The ampersand saying, hey, that's an that's the address of a particular variable, right? And if the asterisk is used, right, if the asterisk is used when it's not a declaration, okay, when it's not a declaration, that means follow. Okay, follow that, you know, go to that address that that pointer points to. Okay, go to that address and either read it or write to it. In this case, it's saying write to it because it's setting it equal to something. Okay, so this is the one that we refer to as the, oops, that program crashed again. So let me just put it back up so I can use the, uh, the uh, Apple Pencil here. Okay, at least it boots like really fast. Okay, so um, this here is what's often referred to as the D reference. Okay, where this is often referred to as the reference. Okay, reference is just the, basically a word for meaning the address, the address in memory. Okay, um, really common for people to mess up in terms of the fact that it's is it is confusing so the syntax of the difference between declaring and um dereferencing a variable because in your case you're using the the asterisk okay now let's talk about another area of confusion which is basically using the um the dot versus the arrow okay the arrow only comes up in the context of of structures okay typically all right, so, all right, let me just kind of get another page here. So if we have a structure, I'm just going to kind of make it up. Okay. Okay, so let's just this is structure my struct. Okay. And if if I declare a structure here, call it S. Okay, notice that this is this type of this is just a regular data type. Right, just happens to be a structure, right? We, when we build structures, we build them to be, it's like a custom data type, just like you would build a class um, in Java and have an object of that class, right? It's really kind of the same idea here. Um, and just like you would do in Java, if you're trying to access a variable that's contained within that class, you would do s dot and whatever the variable is, right? Using what's often referred to as dot notation. Okay, that's really nothing different than what you saw in Java, except we're using structures instead of classes, right? C does not have classes, right? Classes contain functions, right? Methods that belong to that um, to that class. C doesn't have that. It just has structures as data that is kind of encapsulated together. Okay. So, um, well, where does the arrow come? From? Okay. Well, the thing is, sometimes you don't have just a regular data type like this. Okay, sometimes it's not just a regular data type, it's a pointer. Okay, notice that this is of type my structure pointer. Okay. And if you're trying to access a member of that, right, let's just say we had some code that initialized this or something, you know, that um, that had space for that in memory using malloc or whatever. Okay, so I'm just doing a bunch of dots, kind of skipping those steps. And we're trying to access the data member X. Okay. This would not be appropriate, right? Because what we really have in memory here is a pointer, right? That points to an area of memory that contains that X and Y. Okay, so we'll write that a little more legibly. That that S is a pointer that points to an area of memory 
that contains that information. Okay, so S dot would not work because that's referring to this location here, not over here. Okay, so there's two different ways to solve that, right? One is we dereference S, and I'm going to put in parentheses just to make it really clear what we're doing. Okay, the dereference will follow this arrow, right? Will go to where the pointer points to, and then we can go ahead and get the data member X, okay? And the arrow here is just a shorthand for that, okay? S arrow X is just another way of doing the same thing, okay? Of they mean the same thing. We're dereferencing that pointer and getting the, the member X. It's the same thing doing S arrow X, okay? All right, so that's uh, kind of the crash course of reviewing uh, pointers and a lot of the notation and everything. Um, and we've got a little less than 10 minutes. I'm going to try to be really punctual in the time here. Let me first check if we have any questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, and for the last little bit here, let's take a look at file I.O. Okay, which is a, like I kind of repeated said, is a pretty Pretty straightforward topic. Um, let me see if I can just rotate this here. So I, what I want to point out is um, remember that for topics like this that you've got some things to reference that are really designed to, to help you quite a bit. Okay, is I, you know I don't want what I don't want people to do is I don't want you to feel like you have to memorize some like key things that are that in the real world are super easy to look up right I want to make sure that you understand like the logic the concepts how to actually apply it and use it okay that's stuff that even if you even if you had were looking at some code if you didn't understand what it did and, and how it worked you wouldn't really be able to edit it and, and change it so just looking at really kind of key concepts right so this reference is really everything that you need to know to kind of use files uh, appropriate, at least some of the very basics, which is really all that we did in this class. All right, well, it's not really anything that's that's uh, very different than what you see in some other languages. Right here, I mean, let me zoom in a little bit, make sure everybody can kind of see this uh, well. Um, and you know what, I'm really not a fan of, of doing it in uh, this software. I'm going to copy it in that. I think the drawing utility is better in Word when I'm doing it on Windows. Let me copy this over. All right, so I want you to remember that the R here stands for opening the file for reading, the W for writing, okay? And if uh, we have some different ways of basically reading or writing from a file, okay? So what's returned here, either way, we have to open a file before we can do anything with it, right? We're either opening it for reading or we're opening it for writing, and there's others, just like other languages, there's, there's different ways of opening that, uh, depending on what, what you're trying to do, but we're just really focusing on those. And the data type that we get back is of type file pointer, okay? Um, and notice the file pointer that type is the same thing that's being used as an input argument into these other functions. Okay, so these other functions that in this case are for reading or writing information, okay, or checking whether or not we've reached the end of a file, okay, and um, this last one, right, EOF stands for end of file, returns a boolean of whether or not we're at the end of the file or not, okay, it's, which is extremely handy. All right, so we need to um, you can actually, let's see, oftentimes, um, here, what you often want to do, what's actually not shown here, is also when you're done, is just use F close to actually close the file, right? So you open it, you do what you need to do, and then you close it when you're done. Okay. So, um, all right, so what is some of the key things here that we need to kind of remember or do? Well, some of it is that if we're reading from a file, we're going to use these format specifiers just like we were doing um, if we're using, say, printf or scanf, 
right, for this here indicating that the type is integer. Okay, you can always reference that in documentation. Um, you can always use that um, to reference anything that you can do. Remember how to, uh, how to okay. Um, all right, so let me just see this. We got a question come in. For f open, are r and w um, are they for a particular function? Those are hard coded, okay? r and w are, um, are this is basically what we're passing in as a string, okay? And we're just using r for read, w for write, okay? Um, you're going to use those for um, f open. That function knows how to interpret that string. The reason it's a string and not a character is you can actually do other things that we're, I'm not going to ask you because we never went over them in class, is you can do things um, that kind of are actually um, a little bit more sophisticated, like string these together and say we want to write and read. There's, there's some other notation where you can be um, doing a little bit more sophisticated ways of opening a file for very specific things. And, and we're not going to focus on that. Okay. Um, so let's see. So if we take a look at this here, and we have, um, if we look at, like, say, the fscanf, right, it's really working just like we would have a normal scanf function, right? Normal scanf function is we're seeing looking at this back end here, okay? This last, this last little bit, okay? We get one additional parameter here, this f parameter being the file pointer, okay? And what's returned is n is the number of integers read, okay? So basically, um, I think we've got, we've got a little bit of background noise, somebody, uh, which really shouldn't be the case of, let me just see, okay. Um, should, everybody should be automatically muted, but um, anyway. So the, uh, it works just like the regular scanf function. We can, one of the key things that can be a little bit tricky for this um, is if you're trying to read a file and trying to read to the end of the file, right, you're going to need a loop, right? Most of the time, if you're doing a loop, you're doing something like this, right? While not file end of file F, okay? You're basically saying, hey, I want to continue looping until right? We're at the end of the file, right? So continue looping while we're not at the end of the file. That's what that, that's how you would basically literally read that. Okay. You can also use the F scanf to do that, right? What to say, continue to loop, um, right? Until basically N is zero or negative one. Okay. So you can, you can use F scanf in place here, right? When you're, when you're, um, or the result, I should say the result of fscanf, the return, right? Checking this variable to say whether or not it's zero or negative one. That's basically saying, hey, there's nothing left to read. It'd be either the failed like the, or you read nothing, okay? Um, that's one way of determining that you're at the end of the file, right? And there's not too much here, right? I think that's one of the reasons we kind of did it fairly quickly is it's, there's really not a lot of logic to look at. It's pretty similar. Like when we look at the f printf, right, we have this f meaning file, right, and it really looks the same thing as a printf function, except we have, again, this additional parameter f, which is the file pointer, which is a file that's already been opened, right? It's a file that's been opened that, um, and then we're basically, we're, instead of printf, like where we print to the console, f printf with that file pointer will write that data to a file that we've previously opened. Okay, so there's not too much there, and I, you know, the key thing that I think is, you know, you can, for that is uh, look at the, you know, we we did like some examples in class. You, the, the code is up on Blackboard. Look through it, run it, make sure you understand how it works. Okay, and then I'd also emphasize like, don't forget, you know, that you have some notes here available for you. Um, look at them, use them, right? Like you don't have you don't have to memorize syntax or Anything you don't have to like say remember that this is the first argument, right? You might happen to, to do that, but you you have the ability to look to actually reference that and 
you know, that's, that's there for a reason because those things are in the real world are very easy to look up or reference, right? That, that's the idea. All right, so let me just see if we have any uh, questions as we wrap things up here. Um, it doesn't look that way. Uh, it's 9 o'clock. I want to try to be quite punctual with these things and also give a chance for... Um, and, uh, you know, this way we, you know, we make sure that we're able to put the video up there if you want to look and review certain things we've already covered. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Feel free. If you've got questions, feel free. Send me an email. Post it up on Piazza. Um, oh, Game of Thrones. I forgot about that. I actually do. <laughs> I'm not like a hardcore fan, but um, that's right. I wonder if this was, uh, did I overlap the same time? Oh, 9 o'clock. All right, we're going to wrap it up, If you're especially if you're watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> Perfect timing. I will try to put the video online. Uh, enjoy it. Jeez, I, I, I'm glad I didn't overlap the exact same time as that. So, all right, take care. Thanks, everyone. Good luck tomorrow.